Hey, Dr. Wilson here. I'm a molecular and structural biologist, and I'm back to debunk some more COVID-19 misinformation. And this week, I'm going to be debunking Dr. Simone Gold. Simone Gold is a doctor who founded America's Frontline Doctors, an organization that has been a huge source of really terrible misinformation during this entire pandemic. Recently, Simone gave a talk to a maskless, non-socially distanced crowd where she made lots of false claims about COVID vaccines, hydroxychloroquine, and how COVID is affecting people of color. So today I'll be addressing the claims she makes about those three topics in three separate videos. Don't take my word against her word. Make sure you look at the evidence. I'll link all the scientific studies and all the data to everything I say in the description below. So let's get started on what she gets wrong about the COVID vaccines. Now, the fear has led to people, they, they really just want to go back to normal lives. So they're either con kind of consumed with fear or consumed with just being weary of the whole situation. That is what I think is leading to people making what is really a fundamentally irrational decision to rush headlong towards an experimental medication. They just kind of want to get their lives back. Right? We've been told, oh, get the vaccine, you'll get your life back. I have to give you the bad news. That is definitely not what's going to happen. Well, actually, in the long run, it is. Yes, after you get the vaccine, you should still wear a mask and you should still practice social distancing. But the more people that get the vaccine, the faster we will be able to get to a point that resembles normal life. With how widespread this virus has become, there are no quick and easy solutions. But the vaccine is definitely one of the best and one of the fastest solutions that we have. You know, Dr. Fauci has gone public already with saying and as many others, the Surgeon General, many others have said, it was in Business Journal just today, Business Insider, I think just today, you know, this, this so-called vaccine, experimental biological agent, actually doesn't stop transmission. No, we have not tested whether or not this vaccine can stop transmission of COVID-19. That does not mean that it doesn't. It just means we can't say that it does. But what we do know is that this vaccine does elicit a very robust immune response and it does prevent people from getting symptoms of COVID-19. Now, based on these data, it would be a really strong prediction that this vaccine does prevent transmission of COVID. But because those tests have not been done, we really can't say one way or the other, and that's part of the reason why mask wearing and social distancing are still recommended for those who have gotten the vaccine. So if you're under age 20, according to the CDC, which is not known for its honesty, the survival rate is 99.997%. Why are we talking about anything in that group? There's nothing to talk about. I've seen so many people who downplay and deny COVID saying this exact same thing. And it's really sad because the CDC never said anything like this. Instead, people like Simone and others citing these statistics are just misinterpreting one page from the CDC website which if they only read the words on that page, you would see that they are in fact just misinterpreting it. The numbers that Simone is talking about come from this page, the COVID-19 pandemic planning scenario. On it, the CDC clearly states that the parameters in these scenarios are not predictions of the expected effects of COVID-19. These planning scenarios do not reflect real data and this page hasn't even been updated since September of 2020. So not only is Simone misinterpreting this information and thus misinforming you, but the real data say that COVID-19 is having a big impact on young adults in America. Scientists in this paper analyzed data from March to July and found that during that time period, excess deaths in Americans aged 25 to 44 was higher than ever in modern history. They found that deaths attributed to COVID killed more Americans in this age group than the opioid crisis did in 2018. These data also suggested that a large portion of COVID-19 deaths were missed in this age group due to lack of testing. I'm not showing you this data to try and scare you. I'm pointing it out so that you can know that COVID-19 is something that we should take seriously and that Simone is lying to you. For ages 20 to 49, the survival rate is 99.98%. 50 to 69, their survival rate is 99.5%. I always kind of pause there because a lot of people in their 50s, they start to get worried and they think, oh my gosh, I'm in such a high risk group. It's not really that true, right? This is with no treatment, your survival is 99.5%. And if you're over 70, the survival rate approaches 95%, really with, with no treatment. 
So here she is continuing to misinterpret that CDC page that I just explained. And now she's adding in that these data only come from people who didn't get treatment? What? Where is that coming from? She is completely making that up. The people who die from COVID-19 are people who are kind of destined to die in this period anyway. My which is which is tragic, but as people of faith, you understand that De life and death go hand in hand. The excess death data would beg to differ. Every single month in the U.S. since March, we have had deaths above what we would expect the normal levels to be based on previous years. So let's talk about these, what I call, I, I think it's most properly called experimental biological agents. You might hear me use that phrase. Definitely you should not be calling this the COVID-19 vaccines. The reason is, Whatever you call it, it's experimental. It's not been approved as a vaccine. It's currently in its investigational stage. It's been approved by uh, the, I've, I'm, I don't want to misspeak, which uh, the FDA, I assume, is the one who would approve it, but it's in an investigational stage only. No, it's not. All the vaccines that are now approved for emergency use went through every stage of development that a vaccine should. They all went through a preclinical stage, followed by clinical trials 1, 2, and 3, and then had to be approved by regulatory bodies. All of these steps just didn't take as long as they normally did because it was being expedited. Not rushed, but prioritized. All of the vaccines had plenty of funding, so they didn't have to wait around for more grants to be written and accepted in order to continue research. And it was always first on the list for the FDA to look at whenever anything COVID vaccine related came across their desk. Those are just some of the reasons why it happened as fast as it did. It's like if you have a million things to do at work and your boss says, hey, I need you to do this right away. You're going to prioritize that over everything else you have to do. What, is, what are the potential problems with this experimental biological agent? The first most obvious is that this is brand new technology. The first two that are coming to market use something called mRNA technology, which has never ever been used before for vaccines. It's really important to point out here that while mRNA vaccines have never been used in humans before, the technology and knowledge in order to create a safe and effective mRNA vaccine has been researched since 1990. This is not a wildly new idea, as Simone would have you believe. A, a lot of the more kind of concerning and flamboyant issues, it's because people are very worried that this is brand new mRNA technology. I don't really go down that path, but what I can say is I don't really want to be the first person to take brand new things when it comes to medicine, right? You don't have to be a genius to say that. Certainly not, but you won't be the first to take it. That's kind of what the clinical trials that test the vaccine on tens of thousands of participants are meant for. But there are multiple coronavirus viruses out there. For example, in 2002, there was an epidemic, a much smaller one, but an epidemic of SARS-CoV-1. What we're in right now is SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2, by the way, you may have heard it called the novel coronavirus, are what we're in right now. I never understood that because this coronavirus is 78% identical to SARS-CoV-1. That's in fact, that's why it has the name SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> They're 78% the same. Well, it really shouldn't be that hard to understand. For example, humans and chimps differ in their DNA by about 1-4%, to 4 and you can see how much of a difference that makes. Meanwhile, these two coronaviruses differ in their genetic material by 22%. Now, how much of a difference do you think that makes? So prior coronavirus um, vaccine attempts have been made. They have failed. They can't do it safely in human beings. And I'm going to talk more about that later. But just note that we've not been able to successfully overcome the human bodily hurdles that making a vaccine against a coronavirus has put up. I've talked about this several times in my channel, but the reason we don't have a vaccine to the first SARS coronavirus is simply because the money ran out. It's as simple as that. Research was looking good, vaccines were looking safe and effective, but there was no interest. The virus wasn't a threat anymore, so it never happened. Number three, there is no independently published animal studies. One of the companies d says they do have animal studies, but they haven't published any data on it. There's been a complete rush to put this to market, and you simply cannot do this safely without published data on animal studies, because animals often will die at the end, and unless we know that, we don't know if it's safe to give to humans. Actually, there are published animal studies, 
and all of them showed that the animals tolerated the vaccine and produced neutralizing antibodies against the coronavirus, meaning that the vaccines were safe and effective. Even if there weren't animal studies, she's still ignoring the fact that this was tested on tens of thousands of humans before being approved for emergency use. Okay, problem number four is known complications. One of the most commonly known complications of vaccines is something called, big science words coming up guys, antibody dependent enhancement. I actually just talked about this in my latest video about Dolores Cahill. The gist of it is that antibody dependent enhancement is something that is very rare and we've tested for it in these COVID vaccines. There's no evidence for it. In fact, researchers found that the immune responses to these vaccines produce the precise kind of antibodies that you want in order to avoid an antibody dependent enhancement effect. So Simone is lying to you and trying to scare you based on no evidence at all. The biggest problem with antibody dependent enhancement, we see this with prior coronavirus vaccines. This is true. We did observe this with some of the first 2003 SARS coronavirus vaccines, but scientists are smart. They figured out why this was happening, and they were able to produce new vaccines that did not have this effect. So there's no reason to believe that this coronavirus vaccine now will have the same effect, especially considering we tested for it. So known complications include antibody dependent enhancement and also some of the things you've seen in the news like neurologic problems like transverse myelitis, Bell's palsy, Guillain-Barre, etc. Those are known complications with vaccines that already exist. None of these things have been shown to be serious permanent problems linked directly to the vaccine. And if you're wondering about those headlines saying that Norwegians are dying from the vaccine, I highly encourage you to check out the BMJ article I have linked in the description. It'll set you straight. There's a question if this vaccine, a biological agent I should say, affects this thing called the syncytiotrophoblast, which is a layer on the placenta. Now, it does seem to do that when you're sick with COVID-19. The problem is that these mRNA vaccines kind of mimic having COVID-19 indefinitely. <sighs> Come on. How many doctors and scientists am I going to have to debunk that don't understand how mRNA works? mRNA are instructions for your cells to make proteins. The mRNA in the vaccine is just instructions for your cells to make a spike protein from the coronavirus. What do you do with instructions when you're done using them? You throw them away. That's what the cell does with mRNA. DNA is the permanent genetic material. mRNA are the instructions copied from the DNA. And just like the mRNA that your cell makes on its own, the mRNA from this vaccine will get thrown away after a short while. It's not permanent. It does not mimic a COVID-19 infection indefinitely. This is just crazy for a doctor to say. So while COVID-19 could be bad for the placenta and the baby, if you get it like in the middle of the pregnancy, eventually COVID-19 goes away and you go about your life and then you're good. Actually, pregnant women with COVID-19 are much more likely to be hospitalized or put into the ICU than non-pregnant women with COVID-19 there's also risk to the baby. Meanwhile, there is no evidence that the COVID vaccine is going to cause infertility or any problems with pregnancy. In fact, there were 23 people in Pfizer's phase three COVID vaccine trial who became pregnant during the trial. 12 of them received the vaccine and 11 of them received the placebo. Two people suffered miscarriages, but both of them had received the placebo and not the vaccine. Now, let me be very clear. I'm making this point to say that Simone has no evidence for her claims, but these 23 data points are not enough evidence to say that this vaccine is safe for all pregnant people, and that's why it's not strictly recommended for pregnant people, at least not yet. Scientists better than me, right? There's the two guys in Europe that were ex-Pfizer executives that complained about this and filed a petition with the European equivalent of the FDA. Yeah, I know. One of them was Dr. Mike Yadon. He's the guy who claimed that the pandemic was over back in the summer. He was wrong about that, and he's wrong about this too. You know, it's kind of putting people into sort of an asymptomatic carrier kind of state. In other words, people are turning positive. You might have started to see some news stories now, people taking the vaccine, and now they're testing positive for COVID-19. Yes, that's because this vaccine requires two doses, spaced several weeks apart and you don't develop immunity until about 14 days after your second dose. 
these people in the headlines are getting COVID after their first dose, before their second dose. How do we know that it takes 14 days after the second dose to develop immunity? Clinical trials. Well, that's the end of this first part. Dr. Simone Gold is completely lying about COVID vaccines and just spreading fear-mongering misinformation all over the place. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you'll stick around for part two of Debunking Dr. Simone Gold, where we talk about hydroxychloroquine. If not, thank you so much for watching anyway. Don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me next week, where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you in a bit.